And good evening, everybody. It's Sunday. It's the third Sunday evening um, in a row or something like that. Anyway, it's talking TSR time once again. Hey, everybody. It's been three weeks since we've been here. I already see some folks in the chat, which is great. Yeah. Um, I'm, my name is Chris, and I co-host to my virtual left, at least on my <laughs> screen. It's Rick. Rick, say hi to everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. I see, like I said, they're already blowing up in the chat. This could be a very chatty evening. Sky 2 is here. Bug Good. Professor is here. Bug Professor, are you really an entomologist? And if you are, we want to find out. We want to hear more about that. Yes. Um, Dice Station hear the Zebra is here. And Brick and a bunch of numbers is here, too. So uh, welcome, welcome all. We've got a great, great show for you guys. A very fun show, a little bit different than our typical show. Mm. Um, but Rick and I are, you know, we're going to have fun, at least. Yep. We don't know if you guys can have fun. A um, couple things just to do some general announcements. Of it. First of all, shout out to all the folks down in Florida. Um, obviously, Hurricane Ian, terrible thing. I have family down in Florida. They're on the other side of, of the, the coast that they're on the opposite coast that didn't get the brunt of the storm um but yeah we have some folks in the goodman games uh family that's uh right down in the area that got hit and everything so uh you know shout out to them hopefully everybody is doing well um you know hopefully everybody's kind of putting putting things back together and everything um so i just wanted to mention that oh we got yeah. howdy from alaska alaska oh my god what time is it there it's got to be like <laughs> it's a different the different is it a different day no it's not a different day um second um uh, we have another episode of Coming Down the 5E Pike coming up in a week plus on uh, October 13th at 6 p.m. Uh, so uh, you guys might want to tune into that. We're going to talk about some of our uh, upcoming releases. And my special guest is the one and only Brendan LaSalle, um, who has never written, who has never played 5E, but he has two 5E writing credits to his name now. How did that happen? <laughs> How did that um, happen? And apparently it's 4 p.m. in Alaska. So awesome, awesome. Uh, so Rick, how's it going with you? What's going on? I'm, I'm doing good. I, I Just before the show, I think we were talking about some fantasy TV shows. Um, you can, I, I want to hear your quick impressions on, on the Rings of Power. I, I have not gotten to the Rings of Power, but I am I'm finally catching up on Game of Thrones, the original series. So, oh, the original series. It, it's sort of a running joke because, yeah. Uh, yeah, I came to that late, like I come to most good series on TV. And uh, the yeah, pandemic well, blew my watching schedule with a friend right out of the water. So we're now churning through episodes. So we're we're at the point where supposedly the show starts going downhill, but so far so good. Uh, you know, and on a greater note, I'm just really thrilled to see all this fantasy TV. I think. Yeah. Fantasy, I feel like it's kind of where like superheroes were 10 years ago. I feel like it's kind of yeah. coming into its own a little yep. bit. And maybe that started with the Jackson movies or something. But I just feel like with Game of Thrones and Rings of Power and the new Game of Thrones series, it's like the studios or whatever are realizing, hey, like we can do these and make them and they can be serious and not a joke. And, you know, they can make money, but also please people. And, and it's just so good to see, you know, that yeah. on TV. I, I agreed. Yeah, I'm soaking up. Obviously, uh, well, love in Star Wars right now. Uh, Andor mm -hmm. is a, a grittier, yeah, you know, Andor. kind of spy thriller kind of thing. I, I mm -hmm. kind of dig it. I, I like it. And you, even though people are saying there's no fan service in there. Oh, yeah, there's fan service. It's just pretty <laughs> deep cuts. People are not getting the 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 deep cuts the casual fans are really not getting it there's no uh there's no no, no r2d2s and c3po's in the background mm. in this in this series but you know names drop and everything what's awesome is that they're actually pulling from some of the uh uh some some of the source material is back from legends from the old role-playing game stuff which i love yeah. which so i hold out hope that one of these days one of the mm. old modules i wrote like they're gonna take something from and put it mm -hmm. in a tv show so um yeah fingers crossed on that because you know it could happen you know it mm -hmm. could totally happen but uh uh rings of power uh, so i do not know the source material um and and i know no, most people do not know the source material from what i understand um uh, it is a gorgeous show uh mm -hmm. without a doubt i mean they did not spare any detail mm -hmm. um with the the vistas and and the special effects and everything um, a little bit slow. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give it that. And, um, you know, a lot of stuff happened this last episode. Really, it felt like things were, you know, starting to finally, finally come to a head. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not terrible. I mean, you know, I've heard a lot of people not liking it, but mm -hmm. um, it's been it's been fine. You know, it's it's been mm -hmm. fine. And it's been it's been a worthy watch, I think. So okay. I, I, I definitely like it. It's definitely time well spent, I think. And And again, 
gorgeous. Just to, just to sit back and immerse yourself in the world is is amazing. So, mm -hmm. um, and we got Dice Station Zebra enjoying Andor as well. Awesome. Um, yes, the fantasy and everybody books. Yes. Um, I actually did watch uh, Vox Machina, um, which was the Critical Role cartoon, um, and it really wasn't bad. It was a hmm. little edgier than I prefer, uh -huh. <laughs> a little bit, um, but um, it actually wasn't. It was it, it was actually pretty enjoyable, and I I stayed with the the whole series, and uh, hmm. I'm looking forward to watching some more. So yeah, that was my nice. sky too. I, I have to admit, um, I uh, agree 100 there. So, um, but. Let's talk about what we are doing tonight. Um, yeah. So we're, like I said, very excited. So we are going to do our top 10 uh, adventure module series uh, yeah. tonight. So, um, and and we can talk a little bit about what's a series and what's not a series. Um, but uh, this is exciting. So this, this all kind of started uh, two and a half years ago, right when the pandemic started. And uh, we did an episode... Uh, we did a, 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 a Twitch show um, during CyclopsCon, I believe it was the original CyclopsCon, uh, where a bunch of us got together and we did our top 10 adventure module list. And really, I guess you could make the argument that Talking TSR was kind of born out of that. Mm -hmm. um, I was on that panel, Rick was not, but I believe you said you were watching live and you were doing your own list on the side or yeah. something. And I remember you emailed me your list like a day later or that day <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. And and that really was like um, after yeah. that convention, you know, yeah. Joe was like, "Hey, we should you should do a show." And I said, "Okay." And and Rick and I got talking and everything. And then yeah. um, you know, a couple of things happened, and you know, a few beers later, and 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 all of a sudden, it's <laughs> it's talking TSR, and and this is our thirty eighth episode, and I'm excited because we got two more episodes left this season, which yeah. is going to bring us to a nice round forty, and then next year. <laughs> Drum roll, please. We have episode fifty. We gotta think something about. We gotta have crazy. some kind of, I don't know, a roast or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, something, something. Something. We gotta do something unusual. So, um, so that's really how this started. So, so yeah. we're gonna give you our top ten adventure classic adventure module series. Notice yeah. my careful wording there. Classic yeah. adventure module series. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, a follow up to this show will be. In three weeks from now, we're going to do our top 10 adventure modules, which is yeah. going to be really exciting. So, the Rick, why don't 10. you tell the folks how you kind of came up with your list and how you went through your criteria? Sure. Um, well, first off, you know, kind of one big question, which seems simple, but it I had to think about it is, you know, what constitutes a module series? What do I, how do I define like a series? For me, and this is, and Chris and I may diverge on this because we didn't discuss really any of this beforehand. Um, to me, it's it's separate modules that were purposely meant to be run together, either via notes in the module or some indication in the module or the number, something that made it clear that, you know, the authors had some intent to connect these things. Um, or or they at the very least, they connect, uh, they're connected via shared locale or, you know, strong theme or something, basically something that strongly binds them together. Um, now, now, how would you define your your definition of that Chris um yeah I, I played with that definition a little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> I have I have definitely one one selection on here um that probably doesn't uh fall to that criteria uh but yeah I mean essentially it's a series of adventures a series of adventure modules um that you like you said were intended to be played in in order um mm -hmm. you know, not not to saying that maybe you wouldn't go off and do something in between and then come back to it yeah. Um, but, but definitely, you know, you would play, you know, number one first, number two, three, four, mm -hmm. um, in, in that, in that order. Yeah. And that's, I guess not necessarily in that order, but some of them specifically in that order. So, yeah. Um, yeah. and, and when you, when you take that criteria, it does actually limit your choices yeah. pretty quickly on, mm -hmm. on what you can do with, I, I think, um, I think there's like 15 or 17 or so that fit that criteria mm -hmm. or something in that general area. And, and some of them are stretching it a little bit, but mm -hmm. I think that's what's fun about these lists is to stretch it a little bit. Yes. So, so, so how did you rank your 10 through nine, if you will? And, and also, do you have any honorable mentions? Okay. Um, and I do, I have, okay. I have some honorable mention so stuff. I suggest we do the honorable mentions at the end kind of quickly, okay. because if we do them now, since there's so few series, I think it might spoil something. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, that. definitely. Um, okay. You know, and as far as like what I was looking for, like the first, I tried to think of, well, 
you know, first off, like what's the appeal of an adventure series for people? Because I think most people really like module series, you know, um, especially lovers of these classic modules like us. They just they they love when there's a series of them. And, and you know, that kind of boils down to getting more of the same. I think if you enjoy the author's take on something, if you enjoy the theme or the locale and the one adventure, you're getting more of it, you know, but maybe with a fresh spin. And that kind of goes into what I'm looking for. Like my criteria was a strong connecting thread or mission or something, you know, locale, something really tight that pulls these modules together so they're not just disparate elements. Um, but then at the same time, each module being a little different. And and it sounds like I'm talking about two opposites, but I guess the best way I can equate it is to like levels of an old fashioned dungeon where we've talked about how you can have a really good dungeon but when the characters go to each level, they get a little different feel. To me, if it's designed well, you get that different feel from each level of the dungeon. And that's what I look at here, except instead of levels of the dungeon, we have modules. So as you go from module to module, you know, the stakes go up, things change a little bit, things freshen up a little bit. So you're not just getting more same old, same old. And yet the whole thing is bound by that that plot, you know, or that mission or that, or that locality that keeps pulling you back as a home base or something like that. That's, that's what, that was my criteria. Okay. Okay. Um, so my criteria was actually kind of twofold mm -hmm. um, to actually determine where they went on the one to 10. Um, as I was talking before we started, uh, I had nine of these right off the bat. Like I knew the nine mm -hmm. that were going to be on the list. Really, wow. it was my 10th was the one where I was kind of like, <clears throat> will it be this series or will it be that series? Mm -hmm. Or will it be this series or will it be that series? And I had to really kind of, you know, fit, sort that one out, kind of suss that out exactly which one that was going to be. But so I used kind of two methods. The first method was I actually just gave like a letter grade to each of the adventures mm. in the in the series. <clears throat> so, you know, by, you know, the first module was an A, the second module was a B, the third module was a D, you know. Um, so I kind of did that and I kind of looked at that kind of composite. Um, if I was really, really into science, I would have assigned them numbers and I actually would have calculated everything, but I didn't do that. Um, but the really the 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 tiebreaker, and I've kind of mentioned this before on on kind of like whether or not I like an adventure or I like a, a module series or not is, is the play experience that I've had. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and I was teasing with Rick earlier. I've got some great stories to tell. Mm -hmm. um, basically, if I played these adventures and if I played them over and over again, mm -hmm. I would tend to rank them higher. If I mm -hmm. didn't play them, I would either not rank them or they would be lower on the list because there is at least yes. one on here that I definitely did not run as a game master or play, even though it was uh, very formative i guess i would say mm -hmm. i think there's only one actually um but that was really kind of my you know like did i play it and if i played it and, and it could be a play as a player or most likely as a game master a lot of these was both a lot of these i played them first very very early on in the in the mid 80s when i was first starting out in D and then once i got into the later 80s 90s i was almost always a, a, a game master so um so <laughs> excuse me so that was really my criteria mm -hmm. was was the letter grade and then also my play experience. Okay, um, and it's it's interesting you say that because I'm I'm you know scanning my list now. There's only one entry on my top ten that I haven't DM'd. Yeah. So it's that's yeah. that's a really interesting point. Uh, the same clearly, with mine. Yeah, clearly familiarity, uh, you know, lends something. All right, so. Why don't you uh, lead us off? And we oh, expect, boy. folks, we expect lots oh, yeah. of crossover. Today, yeah, people so. always say, oh, you guys, you yeah. know, crossover too much. Well, I until we get to down to the top five or something, I'm not expecting many crossovers oh. here. So okay. here we'll see. All right, here was my first one. And this one is an oddball one. This is one I'm expecting to be off the chart, you know, off the oh. people say, what? And there did he really say that uh, for number 10? is the i'm going to call it the alice in wonderland series which he is, went there he went e, there which wow. is e, i did yeah. which is ex1 i almost did dungeon almost land did. and mm -hmm. ex2 the land beyond the magic mirror um those two modules and again obviously the elephant in the room for those two modules we haven't covered them yet in the show but you know they're based on alice and uh lewis carroll's books so if you hate that idea of a module, if you hate a module that goes there, obviously, you know, that's going to color your perceptions here, I think. But as far as 
two modules that are bound together that are sort of intertwined that connect that you can go back and forth between the two and very strongly obviously share a theme they solidly for me fell into that and they're also actually a really fun play and i don't like humorous or farcical or any of that kind of stuff you know like i don't like you know as the old commercial goes too much peanut butter in my chocolate but <laughs> uh for whatever reason I think because they were Gygax kind of penned, they had, yeah. even though they covered unusual material, it was treated sort of seriously and dangerously for the characters. Yep. And I think that was enough to, to you know, ground it a little bit for me. So it didn't get too, too pie in the sky. So, yeah, that's my number 10. Um, okay. Because, you know, obvious connection, obvious theme connection there, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's that's my out there number 10. All right, number ten. It's getting off to a bang, I, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 you know, we'll have to see what happens. But yeah, Gygax. I mean, the master. So I mean, yeah, don't have to say too much more than that. And and like you said, very faithful reproductions too. I mean, yes. Yeah. Very very faithful. Yeah. At least one person likes your. Actually, it looks like two. Yeah, two. Uh, uh, the history professor respects those, and uh, Sleepy Fingers um, is love that one too. Um, nice. So there we go. All that's, right. That's great. That's great. Cool. So, so my number 10, um, and this was the one that I actually hemmed and hawed over quite okay. a bit on whether wow. or not this was going to make the list or not. So, but I ended up going with my number 10. I ended up going with uh, the Bloodstone series, mm. uh, age one through four. Okay. Um, and, and again, uh, because again, H1 Bloodstone Pass, this was the very first battle system adventure. Yeah. So yeah. obviously D&D &D had its roots in wargaming. Um, and I kind of caught the bug when battle system came out and all those, that big fat box full of all those chits and everything. I was fascinated <laughs> by it. Um, and I love the thought about telling stories on the side with huge battles and everything. And I thought H1 mm -hmm. Bloodstone Pass was amazing it came out with a whole like cut out villages and stuff like that and then you had all the the counters and everything and there was a story in there and and i i kind of looked at we ran our high level characters through it we had a blast we moved right on to the mines of bloodstone which was more of a traditional adventure um mm -hmm. dungeon crawl um then it gets a little about the um h3 bloodstone wars was a collection of a few more battles and then there was this whole assassins thing um, and if I recall, Assassin's Run was like the adventure that was set in there. It was actually, it was, I think it was a tournament adventure that was just pulled and set in there, kind of like they needed a, a home for it. So that was pretty decent. And then Throne of Bloodstone, um, for those who don't know, was the adventure module that was designed for, and I use air quotes here, uh, <laughs> the 100th level player characters, um, which was kind of a, it was tongue in cheek, if nothing else. But, you know, you basically go plane hopping and, um, you can run into all the named demon lords um, and you go mm -hmm. steal uh, Orcus's wand from him. So, um, so yeah, I just, we had a, we had a blast with H1 and H2. We played mm -hmm. a little bit of H3. Um, I never did H4. Um, and that's why I hemmed and hawed about this one. Mm -hmm. Clearly the first two are what really resound to me. Yeah. Um, and we had some great times and there was also a source book too. I forget what the number one, number nine, Forgotten Realms, FR9, I think, the Bloodstone Lands. So there was a lot. It was a nice little mm -hmm. sub campaign there in the whole Bloodstone Worlds. And yeah. and I loved it. I loved the setting. I loved the the Witch King of, uh, mm -hmm. of Vasa um, in the background and everything. So um that's my number 10 it's the bloodstone you know the bloodstone wars or the bloodstone mm -hmm. series h1 through four that's an interesting pick um yeah I and so. and i i owned the battle system back in the day and i yeah. agree i agree like the first that that that's that series really started off with a bang you know quite literally Good. um interest all right where am i number nine number nine uh for number nine i'm going across the pond to uk2 and uk3 the yeah. sentinel and the gauntlet or, or what i call the sentinel series um again two connected modules that both kind of resounded with me i i really i love a lot of the uk modules um gray morris i think put out some great work i think he's one of those uh you know authors that didn't get quite the credit for how many good adventures he's penned agreed uh I actually met him once at, at Gen Con, oddly enough. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. At, at the Goodman booth. Um, and this, and now I'm talking more than a decade ago. This was yeah. 2007, I want to say, or 2009. And this, this nice gentleman came up to the booth 
and was telling me, oh, you know, I, I like your books and this and that. And he was just being, we were just chatting. And I ended up talking with him for about 10 minutes. Didn't look at his name tag like an idiot. And finished up and he bought something and you know he was walking oh. away and he turned back and he said here's my card and he gave me his business card and after he walked away i sort of looked at the car and i saw gray morris on the card and i i felt oh. like an idiot <laughs> so oh, basically really crazy. nice guy british accent it was definitely <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. but he was nice. Uh, but anyway, I don't think he always gets the credit, you know, he deserves. And and in this um, series of kind of joined modules, it's it's really an interesting dichotomy because each module is centered around a different artifact, one good, one evil, and it's like two, you know, kind of opposing halves. These two modules that work very well together, and they're and they're absolutely joined. Um. And I and I think both modules are solid modules too. So the component parts are there. The the gauntlet was one of those modules that actually inspired me a lot when I was writing the Scaly God, my first Goodman outing way back when. So uh yeah. So I, I thought um again, one that might fly below the radar a little bit, but that was my number nine is the uh Sentinel series. Cool. All right. Um I, I, I like it. Nice choice. So my number nine. It's probably controversial, I will right. admit to that, probably because how low it is on this list. And to be honest with you, I even thought about putting it lower, mm. which is kind of hard to do when you're talking about number nine. Okay. I'm going to go C1 through 4, Temple of Elemental Evil. Oh. Now, all right, here comes all the hate. Here comes all the hate. I get it. Um, Look, uh, Village of Hamlet is A. Um, The Moat House Dungeon is A+. plus. Mm -hmm. um but then we start to get to the temple and the temple is good and it's just it's a slog and it's too much yeah and this is how like i said i was talking about our play experience um my group actually never finished the temple of Emily. well they just kind of got tired of it yeah. um and i remember we moved on to another series which might or might not show up later on on this mm -hmm. list um because they just they just were not in into it anymore you could tell you i mean that's a it's a good sign of a game master when you can kind of gauge that your players are kind of yeah. not having a good time, A, on a particular session, but also on a particular adventure or a style mm -hmm. of adventure and everything. And it was after a while, it got to a point and we were like, hey, do we want to even do this anymore? And we were like, no, mm -hmm. we want to do something different. And it's like, and we did. And and we totally switched it up and 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 it worked out well, but mm -hmm. we couldn't even get through it. Um, and, yeah. and it was a shame because I loved it, reading it and everything. Um, and it's just, you know, again, there's, and, and again, yeah, the nodes weren't finished. There, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of little nit nitling things around it. It's a great adventure. Yeah. Love it and everything. People okay. think that because we did it, um, you know, yeah. LAR number six, that it's like the best one ever. Yeah. I mean, it, it again, well, we all, fixed all, those nodes. <laughs> we, yeah, exactly. We did. We fixed the node problem. We fixed um, the node problem. And, <laughs> and hopefully a couple of other little problems that, yeah. that were in there as well, but um but anyway uh, you know again it was classic and everything loved it loved mm -hmm. the beginning of it. it was a great beginning and then it just mm, kind of petered out and everything mm -hmm. and and this is kind of a reoccurring theme again when you're dealing with series of modules yeah. three or four yeah. long you know it's hard to find four a's you know it's yeah. like there's always yeah. going to kind of be a eh, one in but there that's a valid criteria and i use that for yeah. I, I have at least one entry on here that i ranked i i literally felt sad that i ranked it you know one or two down lower than i thought i was going to yeah but it was because of what you said it was kind of a lack of consistency and you know we've discussed the temple at length previously so i'm not going to beat a dead horse there but we we have discussed that the length of the dungeon in today's terms especially yeah uh it, you know it can be too much of a good thing it, it was a dungeon that was in need of a bit of pruning shall we say you know yes. yeah. um i i it's funny I'm literally at the point, hopefully my players aren't watching this particular show, because uh, I have one that does. My players are at the point where the very next session, I'm actually starting them at the uh, uh, Village of Hama. We're actually going down that road, literally starting okay. with our very next. We've just ended one kind of adventure, and they're you know going across the countryside. And I've just told them that they've spotted a village in the distance, and that's the Village of Hama. So we're going to give it a whirl. We're going to see how far they get. But okay. I had at least one group that made it down to level two of the temple. And then I realized, yeah, it wasn't working. You know, yeah. like this group, they, it was too much, you know. 
Yep. Um, maybe I should have took a black Sharpie to some of those rooms, but basically, <laughs> you know, so I hear you, man. I, I, I've been there. So it's a valid, very valid point. All right. Well, you. All right. So back to me. Hoo ha. Uh, number eight. L, let's go with L2, uh, L1 and L2, the Lendor Isle series. Uh, this is, uh, and and optionally, uh, you could throw L3 in there, Deep Dwarven Delve, uh, D- Delve, because that was in what the Silver Anniversary set. Yeah. Um, I kind of, I don't have a lot of familiarity with that module, that particular one. I don't own the Silver Anniversary set. I had read commentary by Lakafka saying that it really wasn't a lot of his work in that module. So I, I don't know. I kind of half tacked that one on there. And then Lakafka to make things even more complicated. He wrote later, years later, a module called L4 Devil Spawn that was kind of distributed through, uh, I think, the Dragon's Foot website or someplace. So, it again, what do you define as a series? But solidly looking at the first two, I like these two. I think there's such a good sense of place and locale in the Lendor Isle area. And it's expanded through through the both modules. You get a better feeling of the locality. The characters understand the government and the locality better. So I think this is a case where even more than just mission or something, the locale pulls these two modules together and, and two very divergent modules, but two different, di- you know, different fields that we've, you know, discussed because you have a murder mystery in the second kind of, you know, and a more straight dungeon exploration type of thing in the fir- in the first. But yeah, I think they're connected strongly enough through sense of place here to give it a number eight. So that's okay. my number eight, the Lindor Isle series. All right. Um, okay, my number eight is going to be full of controversy on whether or not it even belongs on this list or not. <laughs> um, but I'm going there. I'm okay. going there. Um, and people have heard me talk about this particular adventure before. So um, it's not even first edition, folks. <laughs> it's second edition. It's the night below campaign setting. Oh. And Rick is probably like, oh, if we could do that, like, yeah, I, would put I didn't that know on my do list. That. Yes. So I did right. it. I put I didn't, it on my yeah, list. Yeah, I didn't go into second edition really. Well, but. again, and yes, it was second edition, but I get, you know, I thought about this and I was like, do I put this on this list this week or do I put it on the list in three weeks for favorite adventures? Mm-hmm. And it's a big box campaign setting. I know yeah. it's not an a, I know it's not an A1, it A2, is. A3, but there are three books in that damn box and yeah. they are distinct and they are yeah. they follow an order and everything. And um and I know it's got some warts. Like I said, we we explain these, all of these have warts, but yeah, um I just love this to pieces. And this is the one that I have not played or game mastered. I have stolen all sorts of cool concepts out of it and put them into my other games and i can see mm-hmm. the chat is blowing up um, <laughs> uh, never but, heard uh, of it <laughs> yes so uh and and it's i mean it was good it was an ambitious um uh project uh to do it yeah. um it, it got off to i thought a pretty decent start it had an excellent middle um you know it was under dark i mean again you got under dark it was basically an homage to the descent series um and and you know so that that hooked me right in there the the surface stuff was okay but really the action the fun starts when you get down below um and you had the rock seer elves so you had these these un, these under dark elves that were not evil mm-hmm. um you had the aboleth um you know you did not have any drow i mean very little drow in this um but koatoa left and right um i i mean i i really really loved the concept of this Mm -hmm. always wanted to run it i was getting ready to run it at third edition and then i had a child and then that kind of Mm -hmm. ended that campaign um but anyway uh so that that's my number eight very controversial Mm -hmm. probably doesn't even belong on this list but i had to sneak it in somewhere so it is a night below um if you're not familiar with i'm sure you can pick it up on rpg um, now or something um it was a big huge box set that would start you at first level and bring you like to 15th level and beyond. Um, and it was wacky. It was crazy. Um, but I, I loved it to, to pieces. So, so many juicy, juicy parts of that. Were yeah. Good. It's a good, and, and in, in fairness, folks, it feels like it's three modules. It feels oh, like a D one to three type, like just the, for a module called dark below from what I remember, there's quite a bit going above, ground before you even get yeah. underground yep. so it's like i could almost see it being like module one above ground module two below ground and then module three like i don't know 
deep below yeah. ground or something. You know, it, yeah. it had that that three chapter feel to me. So I, I think it's I, I didn't go there myself. It's not on my list, but I, I think it's a cool pick. So yeah, I had to get that out there. And just the rumbling the, below. Wow, based on the chat kind of semi blowing up there, I guess yeah. that was yeah. Yeah, and I agree with the history professor. Tui had its moments, you know. It did. People it did. Tend, you know, the real fans of you know uh first edition tend to diss second edition, but there, there's good stuff throughout all these editions. There's, you look there's some creative stuff there. Yeah. Um, so all right, going to my next one, and this is one I rated lower because this is the one I don't have experience DMing or playing. It's strictly because it's a read-through, and I I just I maybe that I, I couldn't elevate it higher because of that. Is the um R1 to 4 is R1, R2, R3, R4, which was originally the R1 to the Aid of Falx, uh, R2, the Investigation of Heidel, the Egg of the Phoenix, and R4, Docks Island, which later was compiled into the Egg of the Phoenix, which is probably how most folks know it. Um, and it, kind of a weird history there because those were uh, books originally for what, what was it? The D&D Association, I think, right? Uh, oh, the RPGA. Was yeah. it RPGA? It or was, was RPGA. It D &D? Yeah. Okay. They're, they're originally, they were tournaments and then they okay. were published as uh, uh, RPGA. Yeah. Uh, exclusive RPGA, but you could like buy them um, at conventions. Because I, I know, like, originally, they weren't even all connected. Like, it was something like, I think the first one or two had nothing to do with, like, well, I don't want to say have nothing to do with, they didn't have a firm connection to the other two. Whereas I think Doc's Island was like a, was a sequel to Egg of the Phoenix, in, again, in the original books. And then as as legend goes, uh, Janelle Jackways went, was tasked for compiling these. And, and again, so it's said TSR meant this to be just a book like uh, Realms of Horror, like or whatever that S compilation was, and instead there was a miscommunication, and, and Janelle purposely linked all the adventures and added actually extra material, and in a way it was a good thing because I think Janelle really elevated the material in what she did. But um, yeah, so now we have this one book of four connected adventures, but previously we didn't. Uh, so because of that, it's a, it is a very disjointed <laughs> kind of mess in spots, but it has some really good spots, um, and a bang up ending, you know? Uh, so yeah, that's my number seven, um, Egg of the Phoenix. We'll just, we'll call it that. Okay. Uh, my number seven, uh, our first crossover of oh. the evening, uh is l1 through three i will include the third one on okay. there um uh the lendor isle series and and i think rick you know touched on all the points i don't think we need to belabor it too much more but yeah i mean l1 and l2 were solid l1 um when we revisited it i think it was earlier this year i think it was one of our first episodes this year or one of our last episodes last year um it wasn't as good as I remember it being. L2, I thought, was really good. I mean, L2 was groundbreaking in the fact that it was a, a murder mystery. And even though it wasn't a particularly uh, innovative mystery, um, it, it was the first of its kind. And and it was one of those really like, whoa, we're doing this in D&D &D now. And it was like, you know, one of those 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 watershed moments kind of thing. And Deep Dwarf and Dove, I do, I do remember the backstory of it, how like 90% of it was changed. Um, but it wasn't terrible. It was actually a, a nice, a good classic. It had a classic 1E feel to it. Um, and and I kind of agree with you. I would even throw the L4 material on there. When I was struggling back in um, the 4E days, looking, trying to find my way, um, I stumbled across Dragon's Foot. And if I recall, that was around that time was when I, I stumbled across L4 mm -hmm. um, and 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 dove into that. And that was like massive. It was like 100 pages or something like mm. that. And a lot of it was just background material and everything. I loved it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, a little bit lower on, on this list here, but, um, but definitely some fond memories. I have a lot of fond memories of running L1 and L2. I've never run L3, um, but I did pick up a copy of it um, in my travels down the road. Uh, so that's my number seven, the Lendor Isle series. Nice. Well, again, yeah, we clearly agree on a lot of our points there. All right. Um, going to my number six. For my number six, and this is the one I ranked down a little further than I would honestly have liked, um, is uh, the U series, the U1 to 3, the Saltmarsh series. Uh, U1, U2, U3. Uh I think, and Chris and I touched on this just before we got on the air. I think it's because 
we've discussed this recently. It actually is factored into my ranking it down because I think it gets off to such a strong start. I love you one so much. It's one of my all time will definitely be on my list next week. Uh, but and, and it touches on those three pillars of adventures, uh, adventure that Chris mentioned, you know, in our review then too. You know, each module's got a kind of different feel, which is nice. But for whatever reason, there are some hiccups there. I, I think the the ending just doesn't support the first two well enough. I think it's kind of like the, the the third entry is the weakest entry. And I also think there's a real break in DMing skill there that can, you know, I just consider part of, you know, a series that you have a first module that's really good for beginning DMs and beginning players, I, I think. And then we go right to a module that could frustrate beginning players and that could be a nightmare for beginning DMs. And it's such a divergence from one to two that they don't even seem like to me they should be in the same series together, even though there there's a wonderful narrative that narrative that connects them. It's just, you know, functionally, it doesn't make it. So I couldn't rate it higher, but I still have a terrible soft spot for it. So uh, my number six entry is the Soul Mars series. Yeah, and History Professor agrees with you. U1 is great. U2 is fine. U3 needed a 20% out. There you go. <laughs> no, 20% cut. So, um, yeah, uh, very very nicely summed up there. Um, uh, my number six is, uh, so I went a little bit differently here, probably differently from what you did, uh, but I split these up. So I went, um, my number six is G1 through three. So I, I split this up because I, I know you can consider this series to be all seven, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, um, so I, I just stuck with it as G123. Um, again, these were great adventures, uh, each one featuring a different type of giants, um, you know, G1, the Hill Giants, which was okay. I, you know, I never particularly cared for that module of all of them, but I really, really liked the Frost Giant uh, Glacier, and I really, really, really loved uh the fire giant hall um those three levels and in the drow and the underdark at the bottom we played these things to death i mean i i've probably run these two or three times played them once uh never get tired of them yes it's just one fight after another but love loved it i mm -hmm. absolutely love these so so yeah i split them up but um i, I you know i i definitely just wanted to have just distinguish them a little bit so i'm gonna go with g1 through three as my number six nothing wrong with that whatsoever and and me to you chris i split them up too <laughs> so uh, and we're going to get part of that right now with my number five um which is the descent series uh d1 to three and you know i guess nominally you can throw q1 in there as well since it was clearly intended to you know be another entry uh great locales here very fresh experience beyond the normal dungeon that is carried throughout the series. Each module has its own unique, cool feel, but all absolutely tied into that underground theme, which I love. Uh, and, and kind of unusual in that there isn't a shared locale because you're just, you know, traveling onward through the underground through miles. Um, I guess the only points I could kind of put against it is a bit of a weak finish to me, whether you end in the Fane in the Vault of Drow or go on to Q1, either way, finishes a little weak for me. And a lot of, uh, I know people are going to stone me for saying this because Vault of Drow is so beloved, but there is a lot of DM work required to really make the last entry in this sing, you know? So again, I think functionally, you know, it's the third entry is a little off from the first two. And that all of a sudden, you know, you're really open, you're given a nice sandbox, but there's a lot of work to do for the DM. Um, so the DM's really got to bend over backward, I think, to make that hold up its part. Uh, but anyway, that's my number five is the Descent Series, D1 to three. So I've taken the other half of it. You took okay. the Giants, I took, <laughs> I took right. the other half. And if people see me, jump off the screen while chris is talking for a second i am having minor technical difficulties so i'm going to try to fix it while chris discusses his next entry here so all right so um, i'm going to get to my folks. number five and this is ironic because my number five is uh d1 through three the descent series <laughs> so our next our next crossover um i however will be so bold as to not include q1 on that um q1 was again really an outlier it i just don't feel really fit in with the d1 through three 
So I like to consider them to be a separate series and Q1 kind of on its own. I know it was kind of it needed to be done. And I know there was also a backstory on that one. Like, I guess uh, Gygax had the had the outline for Q1 and turned it over to somebody else and got something completely different. And then they just went with it. Um, but but I love, uh, again, and this is another one where, again, not a perfect series. Uh, D1, not a great adventure, in my opinion. It's a cave collection of of, of encounters, which were meh at best and and head scratching um at worst but d2 uh the shrine of the kotoa one of my favorite adventures of all time um love the alien feel of the shrine um and the dungeon completely different from d1 which mm -hmm. is great because again you're underground for a long time and everything and in d3 i actually i'm going to disagree a little bit with rick here innovative for its time yes you needed a lot of work at it but um just a fantastic sandbox to kind of go do mm -hmm. whatever you want to do in there um yes you got to put the work in behind it but they gave you a great it's not really an adventure it's more of a, a setting yeah. in my opinion yeah and yeah. probably should have been but they weren't really doing settings back then but so mm -hmm. i don't think they really knew what to do there but um but taking them all together um, I really love them. And you could certainly end mm -hmm. them in D3 easily um, yeah. and, and be satisfied, not have to go off to the, the spider ship in Q1. So so my number five is uh, D1 through 3, the Descent into the Depths of the Earth series. All right. And valid points. And Bug Professor is noting that he has the soft spot for D2. And I think Chris and I do as well. So yeah, I, I hear you on that one. I agree. I, I love them all. But uh, again, each one's different. Each one's fun for its own. I, I and I remember when I first got into D and D, I had this real love of troglodytes for whatever reason with the fins, you know, the kind of old style troglodytes like you see in the illustrations. So when D one came out, I was just you know so thrilled to get my hands on that. All right, so where am I? I'm number four. four. Number four. All right. Well, here's another kind of crossover, a little higher than Chris had it. Uh, T one, the village of Hamlet. T one to four, Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, and I agree with all Chris's comments there as far as the weaknesses. And there are, you know, quite a few little warts there in, in, in Temple of Elemental Evil that we either knew about or we found out later working on it for the Ore series, certainly. Um, but that all said, I, yeah, I find it, T1 is to me a masterpiece. And then uh, the whole, you know, as the location, as the, the Moat House dungeon, I love to death. Uh, so you get off to such a good start. And there's a great sense of a building, you know, building work there that you, you you start with a sort of subtle exploration and then it leads to kind of one or two minor dungeons, you know, really building dungeons and then a real dungeon with the moat house and then you get the mega dungeon. So it's like you get this wonderful escalation from minor exploration as novice characters to the granddaddy of all mega dungeons in a way, you know, that actually climaxes with possible involvement by demigods. So like, what more can you want? You're getting the whole gamut. So, you know, for that, whether you look at T1 to 4 is a couple of four different books like TSR somehow did or one mega book or two books or however you put it together to me, it's a great series. Uh, so my number four, yeah, the Temple of Elemental Evil. All right. My number four, I think, might surprise people that it's actually this low on my list. Um, but that's the way it came out. Like I said, my my first, you know, I think I've got at least one surprise in in my my top three. So so my number four is uh, a one through four, the Slaver series. Um, and again, um, not perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Slave Pits of the Undercity clearly an A in my opinion. A two, Secret of the Slaver Stockade. I never liked this one back in the eighties. Um, but I have learned to, I've grown to really, really like it. I give it like a solid B plus, um, you know, definitely a three is like a D there's really not a whole lot of adventure there. And it was very ham fisted at the end there, but a four into the dungeons of the slave Lords starting enslaved and having to escape without any equipment or everything. Uh, I, I mean, that's it, a plus plus. I mean, that one's going to yeah. probably show up in three weeks. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you guys. I think you know that, that, that we both love that adventure and Mike and Ids and everything. So, um, yeah. but this is, this is the series, my group left um, Temple of Elemental Evil. This is where we went next. And I had we a feeling through, you were going to say yeah. that. I'm not and, kidding. I was thinking that when you yeah, said that. And, thinking, and we went wonder... through we went through all four. They kicked the slavers' butts, um, mm -hmm. and they had a great time. And it was a nice change of pace. You know, we got to do a little bit of high seas, jinx, high jinx, and everything. 
Um, so it, it was definitely good. And and again, the the compilation, the Scourge of the Slave Lords, A1 through 4, again, where they took all four modules and then they kind of added stuff in between yeah. them and, and the setup and everything was yeah. not terrible either. No, um, I think and, it was good. Yeah, I mean, it was was, was really solid. Yeah. So. Um, From what I remember of that with the setup with the house party or festival or whatever you want to call it with uh, yeah. game gold or whoever her name yep. was and all yep. this yep. stuff was, it was I, I think it made it better, frankly, you know, yeah, I, 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 I agree, actually, it did, it did certainly make it make it better and it made it more a little bit more cohesive and, and mm -hmm. because it was again, you needed a little bit of work to, to link them together. Yeah. Um, and there was certainly we did some adventures in between them, you know, we didn't do them all right in a row. Um, but we we had a, we had a blast with that. So uh, so yeah. But people might be like, "Wow, it's a little bit low for such an awesome series." But yeah, because I've got you know I've probably got a couple maybe surprises coming up. So we'll we'll see. So take it away, Rick. Nice. All right. My number three is uh, I think this will be on Chris's list still somewhere. Maybe we'll see. Is I three I four I five, which is the Desert of Desolation series. Um, I like this. I'm a sucker for Egyptian stuff anyway. I'm sure we'll discuss this series at some point down the road. Um, but I think it's got a wonderful, great opening module, you know, classic Hickman style module. Um, I think Martek, the closing piece, has got some really wild stuff in it. Stuff that, frankly, I wish they just would have developed further, like the Glass Sea and just some very memorable places and, look, and encounters. Um, and then the nice thing is the uh oasis module in the center it's really like a travel what i call a travel module it's really kind of a, a get here from here to here you know you're really kind of it's a bridging module between the two dungeons and it could have been terrible and it actually isn't when you know it's got some issues maybe with the way it's styled and written and whatever but when you get into it and you read it and you play it there's a lot of great NPC uh, and, and locale stuff in there and intrigue and little plots going on and, and things going on. So it actually is an absolute solid, I think, connecting module between the two pieces. So to me, you have three nice pieces. I guess the only critique I could level against it is I, I only wish the Egyptian stuff was even more, I wish it was more like my beloved to, um, to Moachin that it had even more of that oomph, you know, that that theme in there. But as a series, to me, there's just nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Just three solid entries with a lot of great set pieces. So uh, that's my number three, Desert of Desolation. Awesome. Excellent. All right. My number three, um, this is uh, interesting. Um, maybe a little, not controversial, but I'm thinking it'll probably raise some eyebrows on on where this one comes in. And to be honest with you, um, this one should have been one one higher. But a recent, a very recent occurrence, and I'm going to get into stories. I've got, I got mm -hmm. really cool stories about these last <laughs> three ones. Um, and there was a very, very recent story that convinced me to actually bump my order. So, mm. um, so I did bump my order. So my number three is actually R one through four, um, otherwise known as I twelve, the Egg of the Phoenix. Uh, I, I think people have heard me talk about how I love this adventure to death. Mm -hmm. And it's not considered one of the great classics. Um, and again, it does have some issues with it. Um, I'm only familiar, well, I shouldn't say that exactly, um, but I'm mostly familiar with I-12. That's the one that I game mastered. Um, but I actually played R3 and R4 back in 19, I'm going to say it was 84, um, when I first started playing Dungeons and Dragons, um, a couple years in, we did a, I was invited to a 4-H camp where we went to a campsite. Um, in northern New Jersey, and we played D&D all weekend long. And part of that weekend, we played uh, R3 and R4. They actually had the modules mm. in the room. I actually wow. saw them. Wow. Um, yeah, I know. Oh. Uh, and uh, and we actually played uh, the Egg of the Phoenix and Docks Island. And I remember being just blown away by it. The Game Master was really good. Um, and then when I got um, I-12, I didn't realize. I was like, oh, wow, this is this is that redo. Mm -hmm. um you know combined together and everything and again it's got some issues that was kind of loosely connected at parts and everything but there was just so many good there was there was these cut scenes that you know that like only the game master would read there were npc capsules there were npcs that you ran into in the first couple of adventures and then came back later on um to play a a, a big role at the end of it um there were you know magic swords 
plane hopping, um, castles, dungeons, the Great Pit. Come on, you say something like the Great Pit. And, <laughs> you know, there were purple worms, there were fire giants. And then, you know, going up against the the, the bad guy, Doc, who was like a 20, 20th level or 25th level magic user, 20th level cleric or something. And the 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 prince of uh, the princes of elemental evil. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. There was so many things, yeah, um, that were good. But but again, the reason why I I've been so steadfast on this one is because we were playing this adventure um, before we went to Gen Con. This would have been 1988. I was game mastering this, and we went to Gen Con, drove and and we drove back and and we'd started it before we went to gen con went to gen con played games played role-playing games for four days straight and then we were driving back and each night we stopped a couple of nights um because it was like a 18 hour drive back to new jersey and each night we stopped in the hotel we played dungeons and dragons (laughs) um the sunday night and the monday night we played egg of the phoenix and then we got we finally got home um on like the tuesday or whatever and and we were so excited because we just basically had the finale to do as soon as we got home we didn't even unpack our bags we went right to the game (laughs) table and we just started playing and we finished off and that was the massive battle um, at the end where all the npcs come back and everything it was crazy it was an exhilarating time um and i loved it and to this day probably one of the best game sessions i've ever loved stories like that and 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 it's it's stuck with me, and that's probably mm-hmm. why I still love this module to death, and why it's number three on my list, which is mm-hmm. amazing. And it, and it should have been number two, mm-hmm. but you got to stay tuned for the next story, which is interesting. Kind of, yeah, kind of amazing, a, but all right, cool. I'm looking forward to the next two stories. But that's what makes this game great, you know, is, yes. is these these stories, you know. Um, I I don't think there's anybody watching or who knows these books who didn't have one of those all night stay up all night you know yes. weekends with your friends where you'd play till two or three a.m. and people would be falling asleep practically and you were just couldn't get enough of whatever that particular adventure was you were doing you know it's just such a great place to be uh, all right my number two uh, and this crossover another crossover here uh, is the giant series G one G two G three um i love these modules i really do talk about so much packed and so few pages and and maybe part of what made them great is because we were forced to fill in so much but there's just so much there and and that sparsity of pages that um you know obviously solid connecting theme in the whole giant thing and yet three very separate dungeons three very different feeling dungeons you know again exactly what i mentioned in the beginning as to my qualifications of like feeling like levels of a dungeon, you know, this, this felt like, yeah, more giants, more giants, more giants. And yet, you know, the second one didn't feel like the first one. And the first one didn't feel like the third one, such a nice freshness there and locales there and escalating danger, you know, and so many great little rooms and moments throughout the whole, you know, thing that it was so what an experience to bring your, your players to these three modules, just G3 alone. I have just such great experiences going to that dungeon with people. It's like, you talk about stories, you know, that's uh, these particular modules, these G modules, I've brought many players through them and seen many players die in them. And, uh, <laughs> you know, whoever can survive all those trolls, you know, um, but just a great series. So yeah, number I don't know, I can't say enough about it. Uh number two uh is the giant series. All right. Yeah, I think they're all I think they're all crossovers at this point. So. Yeah, we're kind of getting into yeah, crossover. Getting town. into that now. So yeah. uh, my number two is from across the pond, U one through three. Wow, high um, up there. The Salt Marsh series. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. again, um I used to I used to consider Egg of the Phoenix to be higher than this one, I believe. Um, but very recent event. So I've actually so again, uh Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh, uh, one of the best adventures out there, um, yeah. in my opinion. Uh Danger Dunwater, very solid, different, mm-hmm. innovative. Mm-hmm. And then again, yeah, it kind of falls down um when you get to U3 a little bit. But um, but me, I loved everything underwater. So it was our first mm-hmm. true aquatic adventure, and I always kind of liked that. Um, but here's two things. So I ran actually the 5e version of U1 at uh, back to the 4h full circle. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was an anime con uh, back in May, and I actually tro- rolled that out because um, they actually there was already a 5e conversion of that in Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Um, so I actually ran a few a, a few new players through it and and had a blast in it. But but here's 
here's the awesome part. And this is this is what changed my list in the last week. A mm. week ago yesterday, um, I was running our 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 every other week session. And I had my adventure all set and prepared. I had spent hours getting everything all set up for my group and everything. And they're in town. They're finishing up in town. They're getting back to the dungeon. I'm like, all right, this is great. Prep the whole dungeon level and everything. And then somebody happened to look on the the the, the city map and see, well, there's this house at the edge of the city. And there's these strange rumors going on. There's like devilry, devilry and sacrifices happening. And the, the town guard had to like, well something a year ago and it's been abandoned ever since we should go check that out and i'm like what and i'm like and sure enough they all convinced themselves they were going to go check it out so they're like let's go check it out clearly since that little line was in there like you know he wants us to go there mm -hmm. i had nothing prepared <laughs> and i was like i need five minutes i jumped on I, we were we were playing remotely so mm -hmm. it was actually kind of easy you know shut down roll 20 for a second mm -hmm. you know um went online found a map of the of the haunted house mm -hmm. somebody had already done one full color you know player's map though there were no secret doors on or anything mm -hmm. um and i grabbed it and i ran it and i you know i knew it so well i didn't have to prepare uh you know and it was it was funny my players were like oh, this doesn't make any sense <laughs> and it's like and i felt like reaching through the screen and telling them there's a reason it doesn't make any sense it's because you're not supposed to be here right now <laughs> it's, it's like but we're all making do and i did kind of tell them at the end that like they totally like off the railroads tracks and everything but i That's just needed funny. five minutes and i ran essentially the the first two levels of of the secret of salt marsh uh just a week ago on the fly without any preparation nice. I some things along the way and it was great we we, mm -hmm. we had a blast there was some tense you know it, it was it was interesting so mm -hmm. because of that i had to bump that up to number two um i thought about bumping it up to number one um but i just couldn't um but anyway that's my story on on what i did a week ago saturday in playing you won <laughs> the haunted house part that's of funny Citizen um Secret assault marsh and it, it's like we said, like not only discussing the, the the modules on this show, but recent play experiences really, you know, now that we're older, yeah. really affect things. Because as I mentioned to you, I ran Salt Marsh for my son and some younger players. Yep. It was his first D and D real D and D experience was in the haunted house. I can say it was in the haunted house yeah. so much, and it really just drove home again to me what a nice module it is you know how yeah. well designed it is how easy it is for the dm yep. to run yep. you know uh i it just increased my respect for you know anybody who thinks these old modules can't teach us tricks today is just so wrong yeah. um so yeah i i can't i can't shed any 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 doubt on that pick um all right my number one uh and you might have thought this was coming another crossover of sorts uh I seesawed, but I had to put this as my number one ultimately was A1 to 4, the Slaver series. Uh, you know, A1, A2, A3, A4. Um, I always talk about, you know, for me, really good movies are those movies where you feel like you've been on a journey, you know, where you feel like with the characters, you've just, even though it's only two hours, you feel like, you know, one of these movies like Saving Private Ryan or something where you feel like you've just been through such a journey with these characters. And playing people through this this series of four modules that's what it feels like for me when you go through a when you start out at that temple in the beginning of a4 and you go all the way to you know running off of that exploding island the characters and through them the players have taken such an incredible journey that yeah there are weak points you know chris and i i think we disagree like my least favorite modules a3 uh i think a3 is like real weak sauce yeah, I, I tend to like the opening and the ending. I a a one and a four to me are the two that really elements of this that really shine. Um, but just as a whole, it's it's great, great cast of villains. You know, lots of memorable encounters throughout. Such a good ending. We talk about a lot of these series that don't have a good ending. This mm -hmm. one, forget about it. You have a great ending. Talk about like a very James Bondish closing act with an, you know, literally a Ooh. volcano spewing lava and the islands, you know, sinking. And what more can you want, you know? Uh, so yeah, just so solid. So uh, that's my number one pick is oh. is the Slaver series. I think that was a, a such no good time experience. To die. I think that was a no time to die deep cut, deep cut there. Thank you. Yeah, it's been out for a while. So. <laughs> uh, wow. Just, okay. It just awesome. you know. Yeah, so many good play experiences there, you know? 
Agreed. Agreed. So, well, no big surprise. Um, actually, if you guys were paying attention to the chat an hour ago, um, Tim already spoiled what my number one was. Uh, and my number one still is, it's I3 through 5, the Desert of Desolation series. Um, love these modules to death. And these are these are ones where I've actually only played it once. Mm -hmm. Actually, I only played the first module once. And that's where I've got a really interesting story, which I have not told before. So, um, and then I've run all three of them. And again, had a blast with my, my group back in the day um, running these. But the, these modules, you know, uh, you know, I three Pharaoh, just Egyptian tombs, pyramids, love it. You know, mm -hmm. just the classic tropes. You know, yeah. uh, genies and the freets, the whole nine yards. You're right. I four was probably the weakest of the two, but kind of the travel one. But there were still some cool things in there. There were some cool sites. There were some really innovative traps. Th this adventure just gave a really nice blend of travel and wilderness encounters, dungeons and places to explore, and traps, and it just yeah. really gave that, in my opinion, of the the best blend that you're ever going to get. Mm -hmm. And then I five, the Lost um, Tomb of Martek, amazing. The Sky Sea, I mean, mm -hmm. just that glass sea with the skating ships over it and everything. I mean, you know, and the purple worm busting up through it. Just absolutely amazing. Uh, Tracy Hickman, he's, he's on the the Mount Rushmore. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I mean he's just, he is great um, in, in regard to creating, um, you know, adventure modules. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I had to put this in. And again, the Desert of Desolation and the compilation, you know, took things a step further also when they actually combined them all into the super module. That's when they actually called it the Desert of Desolation series. Um, that was also solid as well because they filled in some of those gaps and kind of, you know, smoothed out some of those those rough edges and all that. They kind of ham fisted it into, I, I think it was Forgotten Realms. I think at that point, yeah. Forgotten Realms was just coming out. So. Yeah, so they kind of, you know, they did some shenaniganry there to get to get that on. Um, but that is my number one, um, the Desert of Desolation series, um, and probably not as good. So here's here's the interesting story, which I know I have not told the viewers yet. So so my my play experience for this. So back in the mid '80s, um, you know, I actually really only had one game master um, that I ever really played with, um, and and I found out pretty quickly that you don't learn you learn a lot more. By, by seeing a lot of different Game Masters play. Once mm -hmm. I started going to conventions, I was like, oh, I picked up this from this person. I picked up that oh, from yeah. that. Believe it or not, there was one time where there was a Game Master who just never sat down the whole time. And I was like, I thought that was cool. I was like, hey, he never sits down. I'm like, and hides behind the screen. He's always like mm -hmm. up above, like like the, you know, commanding everything. Um, so so there was this one, uh, there's this one new game master I never played with before, never, never played with this group before, except for one person. And, and we came across this awesome idea <laughs> that we were going to play D&D &D for like 30 hours straight. And then we were going to document it. And we were going to send it into the Guinness Book of World Records. We had it all, dude, we had it all planned out. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we had the, 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 this, the game master was like the son of a pastor at a church and we were going to play at the church all through the night. And keep in mind, we were all like teenagers at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had it all set up and it's like, and he's like, and have I got the perfect set of adventures for you? Uh, and, and as it found out, it was going to be I three, I four and I five. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we saved up money. We had, we had club dues. We saved up money to a buy a bunch of snacks to get us through the night and B to actually give a small donation to the church because we were using their facility, which I thought was really cool on our part that we were donating actually to the church. Well, anyway, so we got all excited. We did this. We got together at like, like at two in the afternoon and we started playing and we were so excited and everything. And we got through just about, we got through the first module <laughs> I three and it was like 11 o'clock at night. And then all of a sudden, like the DM's mom shows up and says, what are you guys doing? And it's like, <laughs> you guys need to be home now. And and apparently he had never told his parents. It's like, so other people oh, were right. all like, oh, we're staying over. I get his name. I think it's Eric's name or something. Anyway. So we basically got hauled away and we never did break that Guinness world record um we we hoped to but we we certainly didn't but then it turned just turned into a regular old sleepover but we were we were all set i mean we had our beverages <laughs> which were all carbonated we had our food which was all snack type food nothing healthy there we were ready to go we were going to do this we were going to play all through <laughs> the entire night and then the next day we, were, we our goal was 30 hours and we figured it would take about 10 hours to play each of the modules and we were like our, our biggest fear was that the modules weren't going to last long enough um, but, you know, a concerned parent 
pulled the plug on that and we never got to those do concerned parents you know they're always yeah. spoiling the best laid plans <laughs> i know i know so so i want to hear what didn't make your list that you thought about making your list or what did you really want to make your list and couldn't make the list for whatever reason all right um yeah i guess i guess in the honorable mention category um two two items i had thought of one was uh ravenloft kind of one and two you know, Ravenloft and, and Ravenloft 2, The House on Griffin Hill, which was, you know, clearly thought of as some kind of sequel. Though they're really, I I couldn't connect them strongly enough. They're more almost like parallel adventures than, you know, even, and even, and each one is a good adventure in its, in its own right. I mean, obviously the original Ravenloft is very acclaimed. And, and Ravenloft 2, which flies a little more under the radar, is a solid rate, you know, solid entry too, and sets up like a lich character that becomes a kind of, you know, big big deal later on and and two good modules but just not a solid enough connection between the two more parallel stories and then the other two i had thought of uh which a lot of people will not link together is uh, s4 the lost caverns of mm -hmm. sojkenth and wg4 forgotten Tem uh temple of Thariastun. because those two if you read the two modules they're clearly meant to be kind of played together because at the end of uh near or during to Sojkenth, you meet this veil of gnomes and that same veil of friendly gnomes where you've kind of made a home base in Tharsden, ask your help to go to the Temple of Tharsden. So, yep. and and both expand that same locale. So very close, but just couldn't make the list. Wow. I thought that, see, I thought those were going to be on your list. I, I, I thought, I thought you were going to make those on your list. No. <laughs> no. So I thought they um, were going to be on there, especially, you know, S4 and T. Just, yeah didn't didn't make the cut okay I, I agree with you um i really really wanted to get i6 on this list but i just couldn't um you know it's just like you said not strong enough of a tie and yeah. and i10 is just not a good adventure um so yeah i i i agree with you 100 that and and i also you know i really kind of wanted to put some of the dragon lands on there mm -hmm. but there are 60 i do own them all um, and I did read them all at one point. I've never run them, um, read the novels, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there are some good modules in there. The modules were, you know, kind of hit or miss. Um, but, you know, it just there's like 16 of them, I believe. And yeah. it was really hard to put like a 16 adventure, you know, um, series in there. And and it just, yeah, I mean, I, I thought about it, breaking it off. It's so funny like, you say that. And, and our our engine, you know, our engineer Elena, she can verify this because she's got my show notes. I actually have a little note buried in my show notes that says honorable omission with omission <laughs> in italics. Yep. And after that, it says Dragonlance modules, because yeah. uh, you know the hate mail is going to come in right now. But I never bought like many of these Dragonlance modules. I wasn't. In, I, I never read any of the books. I just was not plugged into the Dragonlance thing. Okay. You know, I'm sorry. I don't know. I was too diehard of a Greyhawk guy or something. Yeah. But I just never went that way. So the 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 whole Dragonlance thing was just a separate world that I didn't have that appeal. It didn't have that appeal for me. And yet I know some of those Dragonlance, you know, modules have gotten a lot of acclaim. And yeah. I've seen some of them, even if I don't own them, I've looked and yeah. I've seen some incredible maps and things in these yeah. modules. So uh, there's obviously great stuff there, but I'm not familiar enough with it, you know, and it wasn't yeah. something I experienced enough as a player or a DM or even owning some of these. So I couldn't put it on my list just to, you know, because I heard it was good. So yeah, yeah. that uh, you could, I, I call that my honorable uh, omission. Uh, yeah. I agree with you there, Chris. We we could do a whole show. just on that <laughs> Yeah. So when we're, when we're scraping the barrel episode <laughs> in three years from 100, now, <laughs> 175. Yeah. The exactly. Dragon Lance. Uh, right. We'll save that for our 200th show, you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, all right, folks. So we had a blast with this as always. Um, Rick, why don't you tell them what you got to tell them? Sure. Uh, folks, as always, we're thrilled. You could join us, you know, two older guys is sitting here chatting about the good old books that we love from when we were young uh classics you know we're so glad you could join us if you like what you've seen please give us a like give us a follow if you're following on youtube later subscribe and keep those comments coming uh we're psyched for our next show which we kind of mentioned already 
on October 23rd at the usual bad time of 8 p.m. We're coming to you with our top 10 classic adventures, Chris and I. We've, we've never gone together with these on the air, so that will be a really great show. And then on November 13th, we're going to have our last show for the season, which will be sort of our holiday, you know, geek gift guide kind of show yeah. that we did something similar once before. And we had a lot of fun with it. So another unusual show that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, but I think we can go on to the pearls of wisdom. So why don't you roll with that, Chris? So, yeah, I I'm going to say right now, give some of these some of these series a try, folks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Egg of the Phoenix. I'm sure you can get it on drive through RPG right now um or or night below i mean i know they might you know they're they're probably a little bit under the radar um but uh you know there's a lot of good stuff in there and again there's some there's some not good stuff either also not either um but uh but just give them a try because there there's some solid material in there and i think you might actually find a gem or two um that you probably didn't realize and um and and that's it so enjoy Definitely, definitely good advice. Um, my, my quick uh, pearl of wisdom here, I'll try to make it quick because we're running over. Uh, to me, when I looked at all these adventure series, they all kind of had three things, everything on my list, I felt that they had progress, they had a sense of progress, a sense of discovery, and a sense of escalation. And to me, any adventure, whether it's a series of adventures or standalone adventure, can do with those, you know, progress being a feeling that the characters are progressing towards something, accumulating clues, working toward a goal. They need that. Discovery, that's new experiences, new encounters, fresh places to visit. To me, very important, whether it's layers of a dungeon or modules or a different separate adventures. And then escalation, something I love increasing stakes greater difficulty building toward you know that that kind of very somatic climax uh something to me that, again any adventure can benefit from so i think these module series show us something that you can put that the dm can distill down into one adventure you know you can learn from these series what they do can be done in one adventure successfully too and make a good adventure Great. Excellent advice. Oh, so, yep. So we're sorry that we went over a bit tonight, but we feel it was worth it. Yeah. So, um, so uh, thanks everybody for joining us and thanks, we will folks. be back in three weeks. Um, everybody uh, take care and be safe. Good night.